to galacticconnection.com, one of the most popular blogs on the World Wide Web today for alternative news. Stay tuned for the latest information on our world shift from enslavement to galactic involvement, as well as current intel on any blockages impeding us from our sovereign birthright. Knowledge and self-mastery are key at this time. Our commitment is to present you with the latest breaking conspiratorial articles off-world messages, exopolitics, cutting-edge technologies and sciences, and also an ever-significant intertwining of spiritual support and metaphysical scope that one needs to dive down the rabbit hole in search for truth with balance. We are truly on the horizon of a new golden age filled with the promise for more love, worldwide peace, and accelerated intuitive skills where every living being can exist in cohesion and abundance. It is whatever we envision and dream this new world to be. I say to you now, let's redefine the new world to the beginnings of our own precious heaven on earth. Galactic Connection is here to provide the pulse of Mother Earth through an eclectic range of interviews each Tuesday afternoon from 3 to 4.55 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, Station 2 on BBS Radio, expanding your perspectives on how we can once and for all take back our freedoms, our joy, and our connection with our mighty I Am Presence. Our intention remains true to connect hearts and minds everywhere in order to obtain global unity and galactic and universal acceptance. Our discussions will continue to cover anything to do with galactic society and our involvement with our galactic brothers and sisters. Our guests are experts in their fields and our radio shows have been coined as some of the most thought-provoking out there. In addition to our daily blog, which runs 365 days a year, we also offer a realm of healing services such as our world-renowned implant removal processes, our spiritual past life clearings, our galactic violet ray alchemy from Alexandra who shares in the lineage of Merlin, and other cutting edge healing technologies. Check our site out at galacticconnection.com now. Sending you a wave of light, love, and inspiration, and a personal hug and thank you for listening to our Galactic Connection radio show and visiting our blog today. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Alexandra from GalacticConnection.com, and today is a pre-recorded interview for April 12th, 2016, on BBS Radio Station 2. And today I have Daniel Brinkley with me. If you don't already know who he is, he's an author of The Secrets of the Light, Saved by the Light, and At Peace in the Light. He is loved and respected worldwide for the inspirational lectures on his near-death experience, I should say experiences, and his hospice care and his alternative healing practices, self-awareness. He's been really on a uh, journey to teach people breathing techniques to cope with their issues of disease, as well as how they can pass, not die, to the other side and recognize it's one of the greatest gifts in the world to go through. Daniel has worked diligently looking for the best way to integrate conventional and complementary medicine, and he has survived numerous brushes with death. He's an expert in the dying process, and he was literally struck twice by lightning. How, how, how that's possible, I'll never know. And the first lightning strike radically changed his life. Daniel became a hospice and nursing home volunteer. And in the past 25 years of volunteer service, he has been at the bedside of over 340 people, how cool is that, at the point of death, and more than 1,200 during their final days, accruing more than 16,000 hours of service. And I bet it's even more than that. So welcome, Daniel. Daniel. And I wanted everyone to know that Daniel will be appearing at the New Living Expo in San Mateo, California, at the San Mateo County Event Center. He will be speaking on the Clash of the Paradigms. I love that title. And that will be on May 1st, right? From right. noon to 1.30. Okay. And I have a couple of other panels, Alexandra, but the, the Clash of the Paradigms is if you die or if you don't. And the redefinition, the redefining of death as an issue becomes very important to we who are baby boomers. 
born between 1940 and 1967. Cool. Okay. And as we enter this paradigm, it's going to affect people who are younger than us in this age group, but it's going to affect us more dramatically. Interesting. When 10, Why 000, 40 to 67? Well, because that's the baby boomers. Okay. The largest expanded birth rate in the history of Western conscious happened between 1940 and 1967. Okay. More children were born worldwide in the Western world at that, that particular time than ever. So there's roughly 76 million were born in America. 76 million were born in America. And now we have green cards and uh, people who've become American citizens. So we're right around 80 million people. If you look at the demographics of that, realizing that if 10,000 are turning 65 every day, uh, the average life expectancy of a male in America is 75.4 years, and a woman is 81.2. Wow. So, like it or not, like it or not, 15 million of your friends, aunts, uncles, parents, cousins, brothers, sisters, neighbors will pass. How well are you prepared to deal with this in the next 10 to 11 years? So, and you know, Daniel, they've talked about how there will be such a large number passing because of all the immense energies coming in right now. They won't have enough of a vibrational frequency to handle these, these energies. That's why I say between 11 and 15 million. Wow. We are in the shift. There is no question. If you look at it from the Mayan point of view, it is definitely in the last three years of the transitional period from December the 12th, 2012. <clears throat> it positions itself sometime in mid-April 2017. Then there's the shakeout, and then we're into the next period. Okay, that's 300 years, but you know, they, the Mayans work probably 30, 29 years at a shot. So this presidential election will affect the next 29 years of history, and it will see a complete disruption and we will see a complete disruption and literally maybe a complete change in the shift in consciousness of the Western world. Probably a collapsing empires, probably the devaluation of fiat currency, but even more important, all of this is done, Alexandra, because people are being programmed not to be sensitive. The powers that be, does not want us to be calm enough to be able to sit quietly and meditate, pay attention to our breathing, and find that initial action that allows us to elevate our consciousness into a higher spiritual wellness. Wellness. If you keep you frightened, you keep you scared, you keep breaking the economy, you put yourself $20 trillion in debt, and you don't know how you're going to live paycheck to paycheck, which is 90% of us, then you're never going to stop to meditate and pray. One thing I'm lucky about, uh, we were talking earlier, I, everything to me, that I base it on how entertaining it is. So why I love my wife so very much is she's the most entertaining woman I have ever met because I am fortunate enough to know what comes next. So if I didn't die and I didn't go to hell, nobody's going to die and nobody's going to go to hell. <laughs> and so the argument, the argument of these two paradigm shifts, we are great, powerful, and mighty spiritual beings, and we have dignity, direction, and purpose. Mm -hmm. So the only thing that could have ever gone wrong in our lives, if we, we have allowed something to affect our dignity, which is religions, institutions, or governments, they're trying to keep us from paying attention to what religions, institutions, and governments have done to affect our dignity. And me, I'm on the front lines of looking at the paradigm shift, looking at the clash, looking at what yesterday, we're too smart to realize that yesterday's paradigm is gone and a new one's coming. And the most important point about that is this, in the 60s, 
the Beatles gave us Yogananda, some Indian sitting on a mountain in the Himalayas contemplating his navel, teaches them about transitional, med transitional meditation, you know, and we all had a guru and the guru said we're all one, you know, and then people start trying to comprehend being all one. But today we have CERN, we have theoretical quantum dynamics and the Higgs boson particle has been discovered and they've recreated an example of it. And it shows that we all float in something we call dark matter. I think that's an interesting title for God. But yeah, because, I saw that before. Because outer space is dark, so they call it dark matter. So we are all really connected. It's almost like it's almost like being in the womb, flowing in the in the the uh, the the, flu, the amniocentesis. Yeah, thank amniocentesis you. fluid. I can't speak today. So, Daniel, tell me a little bit about how did you get here? How did you get here right at this moment today? What has what has been your burning desire in the last twenty six years? Well, what what it was was to accomplish two things. I. I wrote in Saved by the Light 20 years ago or 21 years ago, and I've said this since 1975, I think I had two purposes. The purpose was to create spiritualistic capitalism, which is because it's godless capitalism, and spiritualistic capitalism is to find something to do with your life that empowers humankind. I, this is the most important, Alexandra, this is the most important thing that anybody can realize. When you leave this world, you're going to have what is called a panoramic life review. You're going to see your whole life pass before you in a 360 degree panorama. You're going to watch it from a second point person point of view as if you were your own best friend. Wow, that was really smart, Alexandra. Wow, what were you thinking, crazy? And then you're going to literally become every person that you've ever encountered. And you're going to feel the direct results of your interaction between you and every person. You're not only going to become them, but you're going to feel the direct results. That is imperative. That's not what you're doing, but why you're doing it. And in the end, this is a Danianism. If you want to know what the meaning of life is, if God couldn't come today and God sent you in the life you just reviewed, what difference did you and God make? Nothing else matters. So I started writing books and doing lectures and touring and taking part of that money. And I founded the Twilight Brigade with Catherine's help. I founded the Twilight Brigade, which is now one of the largest end of life care volunteer programs for dying veterans in the history of this country. That is so and fabulous. That is spiritualistic capitalism. I was just in West LA at the bedside of dying veterans. Right I've, on. I've lost, I just came home last night. I've lost 15 of some guys I've known for six years. I have 32,000 hours at the bedside, and I've been with 2,008 people, and 300 now, 343 people taking their last breath. And the last one was Saturday afternoon, just last Saturday afternoon. So, You know, Daniel, you said something about dignity. It's, it's, it's very sad that uh, particularly in the Western region, we don't have a sense of dignity when it comes to passing. And it feels very refreshing to see that that's, that's like one of your causes, is to bring that sense of dignity to the whole process of passing. Well, we're afraid. We keep hoping Jesus or some story that's 2,000 years old that, you know, if you look at the Bible, they just discovered the oldest Bible uh, and it's like 1900 years old and the the religious world here uses the King James version so they did they just finished a study doing a comparison of what the King James version says and what the oldest written Bible which is probably in Hebrew and Aramaic there is 14,800 changes in the King James version from the original well, I totally believe that. 14,800. Okay, so when we start to look at this mindset, we hide from it and we go to church hoping we're going to be good. But if God couldn't come today and God sent you, 
and in the life you're about to review, what difference did you and God make? That means the purpose of this life is somewhere in some almost unbelievable task that the divine has given you, you have succeeded. And the, the opportunity of the lifetime is to be born into this physical world. This is the gift. We, are, we have achieved such co-creative identity and respect and dignity that we are allowed to create life here. We can have children, we can plant gardens, we can feed ourselves. We have an autonomic breathing system that moves. We have a vascular system. We have an endocrine system. We have a cannabinoid system that regulates and cleanses this body. And when people get so caught up, Alexandra, in this reality, if you take a good look at yourself, you're 76% water. That means you're just basically a water treatment plant. Okay? And, and we get so caught up in that. I have to fight the fight about the dignity. The most underserved population is the dying because everybody's afraid of it. I have been a hospice volunteer for 38 years and I've been dead myself. There's nothing about the process I don't know. And Kat says, you know, that's awful arrogant and narcissistic. I said, well, I say that so that somebody will come out and say they know as much or more than me. So, I can sit down and have a conversation with them to learn and grow and be better, not to ostracize anyone. I was going to ask you, what would you say are the core fears when someone is in the process of, of passing? Going to hell. Really? And number one, anything else? Uh, guilt, unresolved issues. Okay. Anything yeah. else? Uh, pain. Okay. People are more afraid of pain than they are afraid of the actual event. Wow. Because the closer they get to the actual event, because the advancements in cardiopulmonary recession te to recession techniques, pharmacology, and what we now know about how the body works. You can be dead for two years and we can keep you alive. In 1975, if you had no, no oxygen to your brain for five minutes, you were considered dead. Well, I had no oxygen in my brain for 28 minutes, so that helped explain part of my problem. But the rest of this, now they're resuscitating people up to 100 minutes. Wow. Two and a half hours. So in National Geographic, April is on the near-death experience, and it's called Redefining Death. I highly recommend everybody to go get a copy of National Geographic and realize that we are mainstream. And why so many people, we were talking earlier, so many people are using the near-death experience to frame their spiritual happenings or to create attention so that other people pay attention because NDE comes into play as an acceptable, mystical, magical, uh, ethereal paradigm to put whatever you are, you put whatever event that you say you've had or has happened to you so that people listen. I was going to ask you, there's so much controversy within the spiritual community about seeing the tunnel of light at the point of passing. And many are saying that it can actually be a diversionary tactic. Like uh, it's, it's to keep you in the reincarnation system. What do you feel about that? Well, but you got to look. Uh, Lucifer. Satan, the devil, Lucifer, the morning star. You know, when everybody asks me about the devil, I always say that I sincerely believe that the devil's been in the witness protection program because, because he has so many names. And I've heard all of that, you know. I've heard all of that stuff. And, Make me laugh. But, but listen, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I didn't die any of the three times, and I never went to hell. So I think everything's funny. And my place is this, if it isn't funny, it isn't spiritual. And if you want to talk to me about God and you're not going to make me laugh, you need to keep that to yourself because I am no longer interested because the places that I have traveled in these three journeys have been sensual, uh, emotional, loving, and caring. Like, like if you cut your foot, 
and you, you're six years old and you cut your foot and mom picks you up, sets you on top of the washing machine, cleans the little cut, puts that little Band-Aid on it, and the whole world is perfect. You are that way the whole time you're over there. And the thing that's so cool about it, you are aware of the divine flow, but you realize that the divine flow is aware of you. So the term loneliness, abandoned, these terms don't exist over there. Somebody said, what do you think is the most important thing over there? Abandonment and loneliness, which eliminates despair, does not exist in that dimensional level of existence. You, even, you also mentioned emotional, which most people would not equate passing to the other side of the veil with emotion. Yeah, but you know, people have to start to look at, in the early transitional points, emotions are attitudes. Emotion is a mental concept about something we like or don't like. Over there, you have an emotional side because you're letting go of a, a social, psychological, and, a, and a, a social psychiatric identity that you've developed. This is what's the funny thing. Nobody knows who the hell they are. <laughs> okay? All right? Here, who are you? You are a collective... <laughs> You're a collective, psychological, constructed identity based on what other people like about you. Okay? Wow. That's what you are. All right? But the wow. very moment you get through the tunnel, the very moment you get through the tunnel, that stuff becomes nonsense. You return to the ethereal being that you are. You hold yourself in dignity and grace, and you're willing to face your life See what the lessons were, where you made your mistakes. How do you correct it and identify it? Because nothing is going to save you. You know, they say that at the end, and I don't like to push religion around because I think it serves some purpose. It makes us crazier. But you think that somebody's going to forgive you and die for your sins? That's the biggest bunch of nonsense I have ever heard. Because the only person you can be saved from is yourself. And the only person who can save you from yourself is you. And you cannot do it out of fear. That's awesome. So, so what happens after you've gone through your review? Where do you go from there? Where did, what's the typical, is there a typical modus operandi? You go back to where you come from. We don't all come from the same place. In, the, in Genesis, it's, it's, it says there are seven heavens. Okay, I know of four because in my three journeys over a 22-year period, uh, struck by lightning, and then struck by lightning again. I didn't have a near-death experience, the second lightning strike. That means I was catching on. You know, they have to kill me every 20, 10 or 15 years to keep me. <laughs> well, I'm kind of like an ADHD when it comes to being dead. <laughs> and you got to have lightning to wake you up? No, yeah, well, you know, that, that's a – think about this, Alexandra. That's crazy. Hey, watch this. Here's how cool God is. Lightning, in legal terms, is an act of God. If you go, if somebody gets struck by lightning and you sue them because of whatever the circumstances is, it's an act of God. Okay, so I had electrocution. That's my spiritual self. Then I had 13 years later. Then I had open heart surgery. Oh my God! That's my heart. Heart. And then seven years later, I had brain surgery. That's mental, physical, and spiritual. So each of these experiences correlate with, with a point of consciousness that relates mental, physical, and spiritual. Sure. And, and this is my sense of humor about God. Think of this. I was struck by lightning on September the 17th at 7.05 p.m. on a Wednesday afternoon during a thunderstorm. And the lightning hit me here. Oh, my God. I had brain surgery. On September the 17th at 7.05 a.m. Wow. Wednesday morning during a thunderstorm, and the first hole they drilled in my head was here. Oh, my God. Did they have to drill a tunnel? 
<laughs> well, I just go to tell you the divine sense of humor. And I tell that story because it's a true story. That's wild. I, had surgery. I went through six hours of surgery. I spent 41 hours in recovery because they couldn't cut bring me back. When I came back, I had a massive grand mal seizure. I went into cardiac arrest, was put on life support in the neurocardiac ward. Because what normally happens is you have blood clots from what they were doing. And if a blood clot got in the prosthesis valve I have in my heart, they were going to have to do open heart heart surgery and brain surgery. And they were just waiting for the strokes. Well, I got through it because we are the, the privilege of living in this world, in this life, at this transitional period is the greatest gift that anyone breathing could have. And without, without locking into that as the absolute unadulterated truth, you never allow yourself to see what you're capable of achieving in this transitional period because the flux, the flux and multiple waves of knowledge and insight and elevation come. I have no problems crossing between dimensions. I mean, I do it all the time. And yeah. people who come to my lectures, they see. I pick people out of the audience. I tell them their life story. I have no problems of being able to take the pattern of what I call conscious breathing and to take that pattern. And in the course of taking that pattern, I can pick up who they are and interact with them. Um, I never wanted to frame myself like James Von Prague and John Edward, and I never wanted to be that person, although I am that person. But I needed the Veterans Administration and the federal government to recognize me. If I'm on tour reading minds and talking to the dead, they're going to blow me off. Mm -hmm. And my job was to institute what's called functional medicine, but to create a pathway of centers, a series of an eight step program that allows people who are in transition or people who are grieving afterwards. You know, you have bereavement, which is a natural course of transition, but then you have grief and it can last a lifetime. Oh, yeah. And so I can, I'm, I'm done. I'm putting all the equipment together. I knew it would take 40 years. Yeah, you've been working on these centers for quite some time, I thought, right? Uh, I, I have a, I've had working centers since 1977, but it was when they said. It wasn't when I said. And I've seen the electronics improve. Yes. So yeah. I keep, I'm in my 11th edition of the Clint E, the bed. In every house that we own, we own two houses, I have a program. I can go and go anywhere I want to go. I can go upstairs and go in our room and I can set it up. I can set the frequencies. I can get on the bed and I can go anywhere I want to go. I can travel. I can come to your house and go through your laundry. But That's people, kind of scary. Well, it's... <laughs> well, Just kidding. But hey, there's nothing I can do about that. <laughs> hey, I, I want to I ask you something because I, I, I feel that it's a key question. Not once, but twice, you had major NDEs. What was the difference between the experience the first time and the second time? The first time was the most overwhelming because I got a chance to see what was the future. And I went to this Crystal City and it was so unbelievable. Uh, there, these beings of light that I encountered in this place that looked like it was built of light. Yeah, and there were many of them. So we don't all come from the same place. I thought that this was my, where I was supposed to come. And when I met these beings, I had never seen what you would call the future. I never knew it was the future until four years later when Raymond, Dr. Moody called me and said the first prophecy had come true. And it was about the election of a president or it was about Chernobyl or it was something I don't remember. And then all of a sudden, Raymond started telling everybody about the prophecies, which I just call boxes of knowledge. So I call that section of my life Nostradania. <laughs> it's cute. Well, because I don't, you know, this is part of a near-death experience. And I didn't know, I hadn't think of this, Alexandra. I was 25 years old. Well, you're just very young. 
guy's a hard ass, tough guy. I'm a big, powerful, tough guy, sports, Marine Corps, and contracts for various agencies. Right. Mindset had nothing to do with Adam and Eve and guilty of the original sin. At 14 years old, I couldn't believe that, no matter what anybody said. I thought I was going to the the Royal Ambassadors Fundamentalist Baptist Weekend for Wayward Boys because I'd knocked out the biology teacher. But when I got there, they tell me I was guilty of the original sin. And I said, well, what was that? Well, you know what the original sin was? The original sin was some naked woman in some garden talking to a snake, Adam and Eve. I listened to this, and the snake, I thought, how long is a woman going to stay around if she sees a snake? <laughs> then number two, if that snake starts talking, and then the snake wants her to get her boyfriend to eat an apple so he knew he was naked. <laughs> well, it is an allegory. Well, let's hope so, but you can't get a fundamentalist Baptist in South That's Carolina. That's true. That's true. Uh-uh. That's true. You can't get them to believe that. So I blew all that off. And until that day being struck by lightning, I never had a religious concept. I don't have a religious concept now. I have a spiritual concept. Very distinct difference. Do you feel that, that the lightning strike was uh, because of the fact that you were not going down a specific designated path? Well, I would have to say that yes, because the skill set that I have, I mean, I have a certain skill set. I mean, I, I'm an observer, okay, and I can pay attention to what's happening, and I have a, a understanding of it. But now I'm empathic, so that skill set based on the lightning has gone from something that was normally like this to out here. I pick up 10 times more about what I observe and what I listen and how I hear. The second near-death experience was the same structure, okay? I lifted out of my body. I watched them cut my heart out of my chest. Wow. What they were talking about. I heard the seven chimes. I'm back down the tunnel. The being of light, by the time I got back down the tunnel the second time, I had a pretty good, you know, I'm obsessive compulsive whether I'm dead or alive. And, <laughs> And why is that? Well, how are you? How are you OCD on the other side of the veil? Because I have to know. <laughs> well, me too. No, we I all see this being, right? Watch. So I'm setting it up. I'm watching, waiting for the being of light to appear. Right? This being that every Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Allah, you know, Krishna, everybody's got a name for it. Okay. So when the being came the second time, which I wasn't paying so much attention to the being the first in 13 years before, but I thought about it for 13 years and I wasn't paying much attention. This time I locked on this being of light, you know, I, because it was the feeling of safety and comfort that this being had given me the first time. When I was struck by lightning, I was par paralyzed. After the near death experience, I was completely paralyzed for six days, partially paralyzed for seven months. It took me two years to learn to walk and feed myself. So I had plenty of time to think about it, and I still live in enormous pain, you know, because of the damage done to the lightning going down my spine. Okay, so I had a lot of time to think about it. So when I saw this being a light the second time, mm -hmm. well, let me tell you, I can tell everybody who that being of light is. That being of light is you. You have never left heaven. Never. It's you. And your guardian angel is you. And you know, people say, well, Daniel, that's hard to believe. Look, I can trust myself. I said, well, let me ask you a question. Because I went on this quest. We are basically made up of, your body is made up of atoms, molecules, and cells. Undeniable. If you take all the empty space out of an atom, it's 94.6% empty space. If you take all the empty space out of a molecule, it's 98.2% empty space. If you take all the empty space out of a cell, it's 99%. So if you take, let's say there's 320 million Americans living in the United States. 
if you took all the empty space out of every atom, every molecule, and every cell of every one of those 320 million people, we would all fit in a regular size matchbox. That's mm -hmm. science. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what does that tell you? That tells you we are mostly conscious here. We are conscious. We're just a water bag. And people say, well, how does that work, Daniel? I said, wait a minute. When you're a diver, a deep sea diver, you put on a uniform, gloves, you put on lead boots, you put on a belt, you put on a big helmet, and you go down in the water first because of pressure, second because of climate, you know, the amount of pressure that causes the climate, and third because of how much oxygen you need and the weight and the structure. When you come here, this is a water planet. The atmosphere is water and it's electrical. We have an atmosphere, a stratosphere, and an ionosphere. Uh, positive, neutral, and negative. Okay? So in order to function in this environment, is the same as a deep sea diver. If you're a deep sea diver, you have a uniform on so that you can function. If your spine didn't, didn't do this, you could have based on your barometric pressure and the atmospheric pressure of the atmosphere, you couldn't stand up straight and walk. Yeah, our bodies are amazing. Yeah, you couldn't do it. I'm in awe of the body. Well, it's the same as if you were a deep sea diver. You'd be amazed at how much you like that little outfit you had on. But are you the deep sea diver in the outfit or are you the person inside? Yeah. What divinity teaches and near death it teaches you is you are the person inside this and this is the piece of equipment that's necessary in order for you to function as a co-creator in a way that you can realize that you did it. We create life, we plant a garden, we have sex and, and it's explainable. It's not some voodoo witch doctor. Now we know everything of how the sperm hits the egg, how the seed germinates. We know all that stuff now, but who created it? We did. Mm -hmm. No one's ever left heaven. Get over it. You have, you have projected a part of your identity into this so that you could experience the actual event of appearing to be separate from something, but you're not, and to be an individual co-creator. You know, I get up for two reasons. Now, the veteran won't die alone because I woke up this morning. And this morning before I talk to you, I'm getting 24-hour nurses for a guy who might have four days. I call the VA, I call the hospice unit, I call the nurses, because most people don't understand the bureaucracy. I've been a hospice volunteer in the VA for 31 years, and I'm an old combat Marine, and I can terrify them just like I can terrify anybody else, because I know regulate implementation, regulations, specifications, and enforcement. And if they start messing with me, I say, okay, tell me your job description. Because <laughs> I can. Where's your DD-214, right? Yeah, yeah. Tell me your job description because I can look up exactly what your job description is and how long you've been at work. And if you've been there over three years, you did not adapt to it, then I can report you to what's called the, uh, the patient advocate for that particular veteran. That's fantastic, and they need that kind of support. I was going to ask you, too, I mean, do you, it's very obvious and apparent what you're providing them through the last days of in this reality. What difference do you see with what you're providing them on this side, on the other side? You know, whether they had your service and support with or without that. Watch. The Twilight Brigade. I'm on both sides of the veil. I know you are. I got my boys on that side and my boys and girls on that side reaching out and helping the ones I'm with now. They reach out and bring them across the veil. Fantastic. There, there is a place, Alexandra, I call it the fertile void or the blue gray place. And it's like purgatory. No one has to give up their free will till they go down the tunnel. And then they reconnect. They don't give up their free will, but they reconnect to the entire force. But there are people who are junkies and addicts and abused and, and they're trapped in the third near death experience. I spent 41 hours in recovery and I was fixated with this, this place. They, uh, the Bardo, the uh, Purgatory, everybody's got a little name for it. And when you hear about people who went to hell based on their near death experience, they just went to this particular level of consciousness. 
So I realized that if I, after the third near-death experience, I created the Twilight Brigade because I could teach a way that the person who was taking the training could lose their fear of death because they're doing it to help someone else. So they're not dealing with it face up themselves. They're doing it to be of service. And that if you use the techniques, the holographic techniques that I've woven into it, then you're touching all levels of that being, all of in transition. So, so when that light surrounds them, and they start down that tunnel or crossing the bridge or going over the meadow. There's all kinds of different things that people see. It's not always just a tunnel. Then one of those beings that are trapped in that area will see that light and let go and follow that person down the tunnel back into the light. Veterans feel betrayed. Yeah, they do. Most undeserved. When you realize that 330,000 veterans have died, waiting to get their appointment or waiting to have their classification reviewed and, die. and if you realize there is a system that the bureaucracy uses so that they can manage the budget given to protect these veterans that they have a standard system we call it the pink unicorn i mean that's we who understand the techniques because i've heard them i've heard it all you can't tell me one of those stories that I won't come right back at you and telling you you a liar. Yeah. Okay, so it's so prevalent we have a name for it. Okay, so in the course of that, this is a part of us realizing we're at the shifting point. We're at World War or World Peace. Yes. We're watching this next year, what's gonna happen. When you realize the destruction of Gaza and you realize what's happening in the West Bank and you realize what Israel uh, and what Israel is doing under the threat of its very existence. This is where people need to focus. And when you look at what we're doing to ourselves and then the, the destruction of the Middle East, because it's smart to break it down into tribal regions. You know, most people don't understand the Middle East came about in the Balfour Agreement after World War I. A bunch of British sat down and drew some maps. People think Jordan is as old as history. Jordan didn't come into existence in 1948. Okay. Well, I mean, even you having the ability to prophesize, right? And I know you 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 have a lot of prophecies about 2016 to 2018. You you do stress that in your other interviews. Uh, don't you feel that there is also the element that if we consciousness wise I think you were talking about 3%. Was it 3%? 3%. Uh, can't we change that reality? Nothing's carved in stone. Exactly. This is something that those beings kept going over and over. As you're seeing this, nothing is carved in stone. Why I talk about it. I don't talk about it as a defeatist. I know you don't. That's, oh, why, that's why I chose to interview you, by the way. I'm not a defeatist. I believe in us. We are great, powerful, and mighty spiritual beings with dignity, direction, and purpose, and we just got to get out of our own way. Exactly. We have to find a meditative state, a place where you stop and you do it every day. You do it every day. And when you do it, you show the, the universe. I can feel the divine flow, Alexandra. I can feel it, and I can stop, and I can feel that divine flow. And I know everything is based on gratitude, that you count your blessings before you face anger or anything else. Okay, I'm really mad. What am I have to be thankful for? The universe surrounds you with an energy that calms you. It's nothing you have to do. It's the natural systems at place. You know, you can think all night that the sun's gonna come up, not gonna come up. And then you can think that the earth is not spinning at a thousand miles an hour, but guess what? The earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. The sun's going to come up. The sun's going to come up. Another day will face. Will face. Yeah. Life. Every day is a different life. Yeah. You live in the world that I live in and breath becomes precious because I've been without it. Yes. Breath, you have a total appreciation for it. Breath becomes precious. And the breath that you breathe in and then you stop and the breath you breathe out 
are two completely different worlds. I live constantly knowing, and I study what you breathe in. Air is basically nitrogen, okay? It's 80% nitrogen. And then it's oxygen, and then few, two or three other little things, and some dust particles, and some chemtrails. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Uh, you know, hey. <laughs> Barium. Yeah, and aluminum, chloride. Aluminum. But, you know, this stuff is happening. It, Bill Gates went on and did an interview saying it, okay, because it's weather modification. So I looked up weather modification. 1948 to 1964, if you read the patents on weather modification from 1947 to 1964, it was an epic period of weather modification patents. Anyone can look them up. And then came HARP, this HARP array, which charges the ionosphere, which controls the, the stratosphere and the atmosphere. So, so much of what we now are calling climate change has, if you look at this from a very sane point of view, many of the events we're now seeing occur are climate patterns being applied. These patterns are being applied because then I started looking at the companies, this is obsessive compulsive, I started looking at the companies who had bought or, or licensed the the modification, weather modification patents. You know, who are these companies that have licensed it? You can look them up. So I see the 13 major companies that are in licenses and modifying and using weather modification. So all I ever ask is this, if we're gonna do climate change and we're gonna blame it on us because we all fart too much, <laughs> you know, they were gonna find cow people raising cattle. <laughs> of flatulation okay so finally they have something that you can be blamed for it's you causing the problem so once you create a worldwide glo a worldwide global perspective of something that you're doing and it's your fault then you subject yourself to so many other things so all I want to know is every one of these companies and these governments that are talking about it to go in under oath and have they ever used any of these since they've licensed or bought the patent for weather modification, have they ever used it and if so, how under oath? That should be a Senate or a congressional hearing Absolutely. and let's get it out where we can look at it. I believe that- It's coming, it's coming. I believe we will win. Yeah. I believe that What's happening now in our electoral positioning is the thing I've been waiting for. The breakup of the control system. I think we should have multi-parties, you know, not these two parties, and this is what's gonna happen. I, I think so too. Now, do you feel that there has to be a crumble? Do you feel that there has to be an avalanche of the empire falling in order to start anew? Yeah. You definitely feel that, right? Absolutely, it's happening now. We're living in it. We have the highest trade deficit we've ever had in our lives. The highest. But, is it, but is, it, is it necessary for all the people on the planet to go through a state of devastation, no running water, no food, no whatever? Do you feel that that's part of it or do you feel that we can avoid that part of it? Well, I think that if we're not really careful, if we're not really, really, really careful, that will happen. Well, I'm out here. You know, I'm ready. I've been here 40 years. By the 78 or 79, I had everything in place. I'm safe. I know where to take my little bunch, okay? I didn't listen to what people say. I don't care. Am I a prepper? Yes. Okay. You know, do, am I a Mormon? No. But am I a prepper? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my prepper yeah. been ready for 40 years okay so <laughs> so the the point gotta have listen what are they gonna do kill me <laughs> yeah you've already been there done that hey, tell me what somebody can do to me <laughs> and what can hey. you do to frighten me or intimidate me oh no. i don't think anybody questions that daniel i don't think so hey getting back to the 13 beans 
So are the 12 beans basically a reflection of you? I would say that they represented, uh, you know, we have, we have 12 disciples, we have 12 gay, 12, uh, 12 pearls, 12, 12, 12, all the way through, I have 44, 144, 12 is an ethereal number. So I think each of these were a symbolic representation of the great masters, uh, Sunak Kumaras, the Kumaras, uh, Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah, well, Christ was a Kumara. There are seven right. Kumaras, and Christ was one of the Kumaras. Sunat, they're all Kumaras. These these beings that are a part of some hierarchical structure. You know, the universe is layered, and it's in dimensions. That's what I was going to ask you. So how many dimensions do you think are in the universe? Well, the I, I can only say, based on looking at theoretical quantum mechanics, uh, I look at a, a plant came up with the first one, the German, and then a, an Englishman named Deutsch in the, using the, the string theory and a part of the string theory called the chaos theory. He says that in the multi-universe theory, we occupy between 11 and 17 simultaneous dimensions. Well, when I first heard that, I realized finally why I was so tired when I wake up in the morning. Because if I'm having half as much fun in those other dimensions, <laughs> Having in this one, I'm in a party animal like there's no tomorrow. So do you do you feel that there are a lot of multiple timelines? Yeah. Still, still existing. I mean, for the mass consciousness. Yeah. You I see multi I see them. I live. So in how many? I mean, are there like a gazillion, or is it like what most people say that we're down to maybe four core timelines right now? Okay. On my left side, if I move. If I move leftly, okay, if I go from uh, from my right brain, I can move three possibly into another dimension, but I cannot consciously uh, be aware of it. Uh -huh. I move from my right side, which is dependent on which of my let my brain I'm using, I can move into four dimensions. So there's seven. Okay, mm -hmm. there's seven. It could be eight, but I cannot describe the the three and a half one, but I can move depending on what I'm trying to learn or what I'm trying to diagnose or what I'm trying to create a model for so I can help advise people using grief, bereavement, trauma, the world that I live in, or looking at functional medicines, how to do alternative and functional positions as opposed to what you're being told. I mean, this is the world I live in. Yeah. Okay. So I focus my world there. I'm not all over the place. I'm knowledgeable because I'm obsessive compulsive, but I, I live in a certain framework and this is what I do with my life. And mine is to lose the fear of death and empower this life as a co-creator. I mean, to imagine to have a, a physical appearing body, a consciousness and the ability to create co-creators the world is everything and the tools i need to co-create that makes me a god that makes me a co-creator and the, the opportunity to be godlike that i can be kind and loving and helpful and thankful and i take the most terrifying place there is death and pain and i live among pain and death every day and i fight for people's rights every day in this new book that Kat and I are writing, it's called 10 Things to Know Before You Go. And it's just usually me making fun of everything, you know, because people who read my books already know I'm going to be funny, you know. What are you going to do? Kill me. You open up the first page. It says, what is the number one cause of death in America and most other countries? You turn, big question mark. Turn to the second page. It says, no matter what you think, birth is the number one cause of death. Wow. Okay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought that. Watch it. See what everybody thinks. Then you turn to the next page and it says, remember, if you're breathing, you're leaving. And if you just took a breath, this book is for you. Oh, perfect. And I go through the 10 things that you need to focus on. And if you focus on these 10 things, you will see a new you. If you focus on these 10 things and how we've described them, and because Kat has a different slant 
you know, hers is loving and caring and babying and hugging and the whole, <laughs> the whole world and, you know, all that, that. That's not like a former Marine, huh? I go to automatic. <laughs> I go, she says, you don't, she says, you don't express any emotion. She said, you appear to be expressing emotion, but you're not. You're looking at what has to get done. And you're looking at what that person needs, whether it's the person in transition or the family member. And you're calm, which is something most people don't ever know me as being calm. But it's never about me. It's about them. And I completely devoid my identity so that I can absorb theirs and I can help them. People have to get through it, and they have to understand birth was the cause of death. And if, very interesting. And if it didn't take care of yourself, whose fault is that? Mm -hmm. If there are DNA problems or atmospheric or conditions or whatever you did, you just contributed to the process. You did not create the process. You just contributed to it. Okay? But you need to look at that. In, in the end of life, Alessandro, this is the most important. People must have closure. And most of the time, if someone's sitting and listening without an opinion and they hear themselves talking, they can find closure. And that's my goal. But this paradigm, based on, I always said that the battle for the souls of humankind would be fought in health care. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah. that's affordable health care is collapsing, drugs are going up outrageous. Okay, health care, there is no such thing as long-term health care. How affordable health care was created was the president took $500 billion out of Medicare, and that was for long-term care for nursing homes. There is no nursing homes. There isn't any more money for that, okay? And that's us. Yeah, I, you're reminding me of an experience I had. I went with a, a friend of mine who wanted to do some healing on her grandmother. And I had not been to one of these so-called nursing homes in quite some time. Rack them and stack them. Yeah, and I walked in there and we went in and we did, we all five did a healing on her. And then I took off, I wanted to go down the hallways and look and all the doors were open and I just burst into tears. I literally couldn't even handle it. I, I I was so devastated by the way that each of these people, whether they were our brother, our sister, our mother, our father, our aunt, our uncle, our friend, you know, our companion, uh, the lack of dignity, the fact that to completely alone, totally ostracized from the rest of the world, no joy, no support, no respect. And it's something that's always been really near and dear to my heart. And that's another reason I wanted to interview you today, because I feel that this is one of the hugest obstacles. The most undeserved population. It's the most undeserved population. I have lived here for 38 years. I mean, I've been here for 38 years because if God couldn't come today and God sent me, in the life I will review, what difference did me and God make? Okay, for me, that means that that person that I'm sitting and holding their hand, and I'm an expert at this, I'm an expert holding their hand. When my life passes before me, I'm going to see them looking up in the eyes of the divine. And this is my sole purpose. This right is on. It motivates me. It's a, I don't care about the fame and all that stuff. I don't care. You don't take any of that stuff with you, you know. I care about knowing that I've seen three of these panoramic life reviews. I studied the panoramic life review more than any other part of the near-death experience. I don't want to hear all your, all that crap. I want to hear the life review. That's the only thing that's over there that you can bring back and apply back over here. Interesting. And this is where I live. I am practical, Alexandra. I live every day. I'm not in the, I, I'm in the Swami business. That's what I call it because I've been dead, you know, and I listen to the craziest stuff in the world. But it, I hope it helps somebody, okay? But the clash of the paradigms, as we face what we've done to our veterans, I got a bumper sticker on the back of my car that says, we must think war unthinkable what the end product of war is doing to the devastation of our youth. Johnny, Jimmy, Jimmy Carter said, we can never find peace by killing each other's children. 
Absolutely. Until that becomes the face forward fact, then we will never find this resolution. And then someone asked me, they said, Daniel, let me ask you something since you've become such a pacifist uh, baby. I said, well, it still doesn't mean I won't knock you out. I just don't have to see why I hit you in my panoramic life review. But if I was going to go to war today and I was running for president and somebody said, well, Daniel, what would be your reason? Would terrorism be your reason to go to war? No. Terrorism is political. Absolutely. What would be my reason? And that I would bring America to bear. And if it was 80 years old that we would fight. When you use rape of women and children and you sell them for 10 or $12 and you take Christians and you take women and children and you rape them and you force them to get married as acts of war, there shouldn't be a single American, a single Christian, a single woman or a single man that did not stand up to that. Right. And, and when you drive people from their home and you set and put up this terrorism, I'll take the terrorism. You blow up whatever you want. But if you don't stop raping children and killing children and raping your children in front of the parents and then executing them, I will fight. I cannot understand what this country's doing. Yes. We know this is happening. So if I was the president, I'd call the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I said, give me absolute clinical and unadulterated proof that this is happening. And then I will declare war. And I will declare war to stop that one thing. That one thing. That is the most horrendous because I know those people get trapped in the blue-gray place. Yes. I know that that's where they're going. They're little kids. I know. It's terrible. I am so glad to hear this because I get a little bit of heat from some of the other people I interview whose sole goal is to expose the child sacrifice, uh, in particular with the Vatican and the Catholic Church, but that's not just them. Um, it's just all of this entire network across the world. Let's say worshiping, though, Alexandra. That's, that's the Satan worshiping. And it's what uh, David Wilcox talks about and what, uh, what David Icke talks about. Right. But mine is this. We know it, but we don't want to lose Jesus. Okay? We don't want to lose religion because it's become such a power structure. If you look at the Vatican Bank, if you take a look at these things, you realize that even the United States is under the British and the Vatican. Our, our, you know, you have, you have admiralty law, and then you, you have two forms. You have commercial law and admiralty law. Anytime you see your name in all capital letters, that means you're a corporation. Yep. Where is your birth certificate housed? You think, yes, it's a simple question. Where is my birth certificate? Is it at the, uh, is it where would you keep a person's birth certificate? Would you keep it at the, uh, at the, uh, the where you count names? Uh -uh. Administrative office or something you like that. At the Department of Commerce. Right. You are a piece of property. Absolutely. You are a bond and you were worth millions. Uh, three billion. Best birth three billion, right as a monetized instrument on the federal market, on the national market as a bond is worth $3 billion. And that's why we're $19 trillion in debt. Okay. When you look at that, what's behind that is Satan worshiping. It's not so much Satan as it is to access levels of consciousness. I see those levels. I can feel that. Oh my God. I can feel them. I How can, can you handle that? I mean, if, if you crawl into that part of the psyche of the mass consciousness, how do you handle it? You know, just because you have the ability, right, to see what's really going on. Absolutely. Oh. I can go into it because it's not going to, it's not going to affect me. I do not seek fame or wealth. I mean, I'm pretty, pretty good. But what, what you do is you buy people with money. 
you, you buy them and you create these atmospheres because money is power in Western consciousness. Mm -hmm. The fact that my, that my kids are okay and that Catherine's not mad at me about <laughs> that. Okay, other than that, people can kiss my ass, <laughs> there, you know? And if it, when the bell rings, it's just my time and I don't live there. I don't live in that and I see it. I've had so many people come at me because I have this personality. I have some people come at me and try to pull me in and I deal with death and I built the Twilight Brigade and I am really knowledgeable how the healthcare system operates. And what I, I have had them come at me and offer me when hospices were for, for nonprofit. I've had people come at me to get me to come in and be on their boards to pay me to go and be a part of that hospice program. Mm. Heard it because if you look at Medicaid and Medicare, if you own nursing homes and you don't have a hospice program, then you won't get you don't get paid. So if you have don't have a hospice program and they didn't want a nonprofit, they wanted to be able to turn it into a corporation and then they wanted to be able to buy them and they wanted to use me to do it. Well I would be a multimillionaire oh, more times than you can imagine if I had bought into it. Well, and they want to keep that wheel going. I mean, I, I have uh, several friends that are in hospice care. They're both nurses. And the stories that they've told me, not only do they turn my stomach, but the bottom line is the individual is not sent into the home to try to help them get well. The individual must stay within the protocol to make sure that they die. And they have only a certain period of time in which to die or that hospice center does not receive the funding that they they're supposed to receive. It's just disgusting. Six months. So dope. <sighs> oh, no. So could you tell those two friends of yours that are hospice nurses that I, Daniel Brinkley said, I love them with all my heart and for what they are courageous enough to keep at it. Very courageous. Then you tell them if I ever meet them or see them someplace, they're going to get the biggest sloppiest kiss that two women could ever possibly get, and they're gonna get a hug that's gonna probably squeeze the life out of them. I will do that, and also, they actually help people transition to the other side as they're doing it. It's one of the main reasons they were called to do it, because we need more and more of those. It's just like what you said, that blue-gray area, they get stuck there, all those children's souls. It's a horrible thing. And we are allowing it to happen. We're allowing the highest power, the Pope, and he's trying to do a decent job, I think, but we're allowing this to go on. We're allowing this to happen, and for what reason? So Jesus won't get mad at us, and we're allowing, uh, we're allowing what we call Isola Dasha. Those people are funded by the United States. We created ISIS. We did it. 85% of all the equipment that they have came from us. It's American made. Okay, well, let me ask you a question. How do they resupply? Yeah, I'm a combat Marine. You they do it through, they drew through BP and Exxon Mobil through the funding of the, the oil companies, which are behind the whole thing. Well, the oil companies, look, the, look what the Russians did. The Russians drew, blew up 1,000 tankers, 1,000 tankers. Why gas was $1.87 was they were stealing oil from Iraq and Syria, sell it, refining it in Turkey, and selling it worldwide. Who was buying it? So how do they still resupply? Those bullets and those mortars have to be made somewhere. They're made in America. So how do they keep resupplying their ammunition? Okay. So Daniel, you mean they, there's still things being made in the United States of America? <laughs> or, or assembled. That, that's like a concept. <laughs> well, if you look at a 223 round for an M4, what is a standard weapon in the United States, uh, our, our bullets are made in China because they need tungsten. So all the bullets that the Americans use for war are manufactured in China. Okay, what kind of scam is that? It's totally a scam. So here's our point. We are at the juncture of where the clash of the paradigms 
is on us. I agree. And if we don't stop, take a deep breath, open up our hearts and receive, know that in the calmness, there is a divine flow that if you start in gratitude, what are you thankful for? And you start in gratitude, you got a chance. And if you don't, you will be a part of a system that turns you into a slave. And from that, you will turn into eugenics. They will get rid of five or six billion of us because that is not a manageable supply system based on the concept that is being used that comes from the old, like David Icke says, the old reptilian concept. We need X amount of miners, X amount of food, X amount of products, so that we can live that life of luxury and communication with those elemental forces like the Ouija board, but those forces that I can sense those levels of consciousness. They're about empowerment and about ego and about narcissism. The way America has raised its children since the establishment of the, the banking system that we now use, the Brentwood, Dunwoody, uh, system is we all hope our children will grow up to be narcissistic sociopaths. And if you look at every successfully wealthy person, look at Donald Trump. I can't say he's bad. I can't say he's good, but I can say he's a narcissistic sociopath. <laughs> okay. And then you look at Bernie. We have a narcissistic sociopath on one end. We have a communist on the other end and we have Hillary. Okay, and this is where we have, this is what we have. So we are watching the shifting and the change in the demise of uh, hundreds of years old, but the last hundred years since the Civil War. Yeah. We created commerce and admiralty law and merged them when we went from sails to steam. Okay, from we went from a sailboat to a steamboat, which mandated insurance on delivery. That's admiralty law. Tort reform came out of its commerce, and canon law is completely left out. You don't even see the 13th or the 14th Amendment. When you look at reading the amendments to the Constitution, you don't even see the 14th Amendment. Well, because it's not, it's not legal, you know? Yeah, so I uh, there too. Well, man, Daniel, I would I'm, love to call... I'm, I've been so boring. Uh, you want to hurry up and get off? No, you, <laughs> no, we're we're only slotted for an hour, and I know you're on a time crunch. Yeah. Um, no, I would love to call you back on to go over your prophecies. Well, just get a hold of Cat Alexandra. You know, I'm out here, and I'm going to fight to the last breath I draw. That's what I'm going to do. I know be very interesting. Nobody's going to frighten me. No, and and we just. I, I really want to thank you because that is one huge sector of the population, the, those that are passing and dying, those that are uh, interned and also, uh, you know, very sickly that we have completely turned our back on. I remember meeting a healer and you could have heard a pin drop and he was doing a workshop and he was from Taiwan and he said the most memorable moment of his life was when he got off of the plane from Taiwan. He landed in, I believe it was New York City or something. And he said when he stepped off the plane and he started walking around through the, to the community, he said he didn't even know what to do because he looked at all of the people, maybe in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and he said he couldn't believe how many people were walking around with a walker and how many people were hunched over like this and how many people were just completely riddled with pain in their face. And he said, I literally fell to my knees and cried out and said, God, why have you brought me here? And I mean, the, the whole audience started crying. And it was such an impacting moment for all of us to recognize. You know, it's great for all of these causes but this cause is very important as well because we all have to face it sooner or later that we will be checking out one day. What's the number one cause of death in America and most other countries? Birth. Birth. I got it right. And once you realize that, Alexandra, once you realize it, 
then it's the steps that we take and how we look at ourselves and think about ourselves. And I want everybody to please come. I've been doing this show with Kenny since he started. I like it. I don't charge Kenny as much as I charge for most programs that I do because I love to see the people. Yeah. I like to get around them and hug them and walk around with them and talk to them and get a chance to that place where I normally I go on the stage and I have to leave or it's signing a book or blah, 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 blah. where's Kenny? <laughs> I can just walk around, you know, I can hug everybody. I can spend time with them. And I, I think that my presentation co only costs what it is to get into the show. Yeah, it's really reasonable, everybody. And what he's referring to is the New Living Expo. It's in San Mateo, California, at the San Mateo County Event Center. And Daniel will be doing his presentation on the Clash of the Paradigms on May 1st, which is Sunday. And I know you have a couple other ones. Did you want to plug those? Well, those are panels. If you're going to come, look, I have a Friday night introduction because I, I don't mind doing it. You know, I don't mind doing anything that helps promote people coming and being able to gather in a place where they can listen to a presentation and walk out in the hall and they can buy it. They can have it to take home with them. It's very rare that you get in a place that has the vendors that have the same stuff that you need to help you experiment, fulfill, or try, or get from somebody else something that that the people are there and I always just enjoy it. I, Kat and I have a really good time and I've been out here so long. Most of the people out on the circuit are children to me. They may be a little older or mostly younger than me, but I've liked to watch them grow and to support them. And to you've really put your time in, in more ways than one. And you, you, you've definitely blazed the trail for this and the twilight brigade is, it's one of the greatest gifts you could ever give humanity, seriously. Well, that's what they sent me to do. That's awesome. I'm like a Marine. You give me orders. It's objective, accomplishment, objective, accomplishment, 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 accomplishment. <laughs> I think that's why they gave it to me, Alexander, because nothing will stop me. Nothing. Spoken like a true Marine. Hoorah, get some. So I know I, many of them. So you, know, you get when you see them. You tell them I love them too. Absolutely. And I appreciate you having me. I you have are welcome. This from the bottom of my heart. I hope I can come back and anything that I can do that helps move your program forward and that help interview the people who can make a difference and to inspire them. And I hope that together today we have inspired someone to pay attention to their breath. Right on, right on. And as I say all the time, you're, you're tapping right into that 1940 to 1967 uh, audience because that's primarily who's on right now, who's listening. They're all my babies. <laughs> I well, them. I would not say they're my babies. Well, I, I, I say, might get... Psh, psh. I'm going to say they're mine. <laughs> you know, what are they going to do? <laughs> get over it. All right. Well, don't forget, everyone, his website is danianandcatherine.com. Danian, D-A-N-N-I-O-N, and Catherine, K-A-T-H-R-Y-N.com. Check him out. He's amazing. He also does readings. He's just, you know, he has kind of the reputation that precedes him. Oh, that's good. All right. <laughs> Thank you from the bottom of my heart. I love you, and I'll look forward to the next encounter on this really wonderful type, innovative technology. Sounds good. Now you know how to use Zoom. Yeah. See, you learned something today. And I am sincerely and honorably thankful to you. <laughs> and you as well. All right, be Thank blessed. You. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And if you haven't already checked out galacticconnection.com, and our daily blog, as well as our implant removal processes. And also check out our newest and greatest and latest, which is the Guardian Protection Initiation Process. It's awesome. Really helps out with artificial intelligence. Talk to you guys later. Lots of love. Take care.